Um, so one of my first entrepreneurial endeavors was when I became mayor of a town. Um, but it was not any normal, you know, ordinary town. It was a town that I had drawn on the streets of my neighborhood in Chalk. And this town was awesome. It had everything. Shops, schools, banks, sidewalks, police and fire brigades. And I would get all my neighborhood friends in on it, and we'd all have our own houses, and we'd make our own houses with clean, crisp, coffee lines. It was great. It was awesome. But something was missing. I wanted to create an experience that was not only better for my villagers, aka my friends, <laughs> but also make the game a little more realistic. So I set to work devising a new set of rules that I was convinced would allow my village to reach unheard of levels of prosperity. <laughs> so I created a currency, established a living minimum wage, drafted a property and income tax plan, set finite parameters for the circulation of capital, and created more and loan options to be offered by the local bank. It amounted to 20 pages of tense reading, which I then distributed to all my villagers. <laughs> So this game, I, it was 24 minutes long. It ended after 24 minutes because, and 24 minutes because I had deemed every day to be 24 minutes long in the game. And it ended because after about 15 minutes, I'd spurred on a depression uh, because of people in capital and uh, the currency and everything. So my friends just quit and gave up. <laughs> and needless to say, they never played that game. Again. So I really couldn't figure out why that had happened. I mean, I had created a product that I thought people would really like, that I identify with, that they would really use and enjoy. I invested so much time in it, and I didn't seem to really enjoy it, so I couldn't understand that disappointment. And it never occurred to me that the product I had created wasn't actually something that they were interested in using. It wasn't addressing anything they wanted. All they wanted to do was ride their scooters up and down my streets and call it a day. So in hindsight, that was probably the first flaw in my approach. And I figured out pretty early on that what might be an ideal product in my head isn't necessarily catered to what people are interested in. Which it seems like sort of like a yeah duh concept. But you'd be amazed at how many entrepreneurs will throw something into the marketplace, not testing at all if it's going to address anything that their customers want, and end up failing. According to Bloomberg News, about 8 out of 10 startups will fail within 18 months. And while the problem is usually, you know, there are more problems in advance than just capital failure, their problems usually rely, you know, rest on the fact that customers just don't have a connection with the product. And it happens a lot where, like I said, entrepreneurs throw a product out into the marketplace and expect the customers to actually adapt and mold their behavior to that of the product. Businesses need to constantly analyze the question, really, if they're actually addressing what their customers want and need. And this is the only way that you're going to be able to create a business that will be legitimate, let alone survive. So with that in mind, I started a company called Radman, which was a customized clothing line for my neighborhood in Madison, Connecticut. Um, and I wanted to create something that reflected the unique personality of the neighborhood that I was living in. These were people who I grew up with. A lot of them came from all different like, places in the world and then would come together during the summer. It was almost like living with one big family. And I wanted to create something that people could not only use, but that people could identify with and use as a reflection of their, their identity. Because we all have this affinity to this neighborhood. And so I knew that the success of Rad Magic would lie in this personal aspect of the company. That's my view That's a I knew that the company would, would rest on this personal connection. Otherwise, what was going to differentiate my product line from anything else? So I set to work designing a logo. I also was pulling my neighbors to see sort of what they were interested in, what kind of stuff that they would be interested in. in and I came back with functional, versatile beachwear that they could wear from the house to the beach to cocktails. <laughs> my mic's not on. I'll, I'll just speak. Um, so that's what I created. That was the business model that I was going to work on. Um, was creating this functional, versatile beachwear uh, that you can wear to all these different entities. And uh, just as an aside, ooh, there we go. <laughs> you can all hear me now. Um, just as an aside, you know, I would be talking to, you know, people, prospective customers, and I would say, yeah, you could wear this stuff to cocktails. And they would always look a little shocked at me that a 12-year-old had just suggested to them as part of his selling pitch. <laughs> I didn't even know what cocktails were, really. So <laughs> that was the angle I was going at. 
So I handled all aspects of the business, inventory management, sales, the marketing of it. Um, and I also did you know, the sales, the door-to-door -door stuff, which I hated. I hate selling door-to-door. -door. Um, but I'll talk about that in a minute. When you're selling a product, it's, a, it, it's, it's kind of hard in hindsight, not because of the physical aspect of actually going out and selling it. You're selling something that is such a reflection of yourself, such an aspect of your identity, um, so much a part of you. It, is a, it embraces all the time and effort that you've put in to creating this product. And then to have to go out there and sell it in a marketplace where money is going to quantify and qualify whether or not people appreciate your product, it's hard. It's not, you know, it, it's, it's not fun sometimes. Um, and in hindsight, it was really hard creating stuff like this and putting it out there. And I started to notice that, you know, I had created this business plan. I thought that this business model was going to work and people weren't responding to the product. It wasn't flying off the shelves like I thought it would. And, um, you know, just to start the company in itself was difficult. My parents invested some money into it, but I also went out and had to raise money. So I did lemonade stands for like half a summer. Um, and then I had to wait. I mean, it was so far into the summer, I had to wait until the next year to actually purchase the t-shirts. And I over-purchased t-shirts. I had like way too many t-shirts. I still have some of these t-shirts. <laughs> if anybody wants some. <laughs> for $15. That wasn't the point of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, you know, that ate into the profit margin at the, end of the, at the end of the summer. But the most difficult part, like I said, was the selling door-to-door -door thing. People weren't responding to the products very well. People just weren't buying it. Um, and I was really concerned. I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I, I mean, I had polled my customers. I knew this is what they wanted. Had I gotten the marketplace wrong? Was my customer base not right? Did they not like the logo designs? I mean were functional, versatile beach wear that they could wear from the house, you know, to cocktails, not something that they were interested in. So naturally, like any business person does when they encounter a problem, I went running to my parents crying. <laughs> and I mean, they had seen me work on, I mean, I lived with them, so they, they saw me <laughs> working on this product and investing so much time and energy into creating this and how I was so confused as to why it wasn't working. And then my mom said something to me, that I'll never forget. And she said it in a much more eloquent way and much nicer, and it was, you know, not, qu not quite like this, but the basic gist of it was, maybe it's you. <laughs> and I couldn't understand that. I could not fathom what she meant by that. I mean, why would anyone in that situation think that they're the problem in this entire scheme of things? But I figured out kind of what she was talking about. People didn't necessarily trust buying something from a kid. Especially, I mean, I worked hard to make them look legitimate, but you know, it, it, it's hard buying from a kid. It looks kind of suspicious. So I had to figure out how to continue selling my clothing the most effective way I knew possible, which was selling door to door which people typically find suspicious, while maintaining personal connections with my customers and appearing legitimate. So that was the next phase of this venture. So I decided what I had to do was I had to increase exposure as much as possible. I got newspaper articles, I printed out more uh, posters which I put in mailboxes and posted around um, the neighborhood. I invested $15 into my marketing campaign. Um, and I knew also at the same time as the exposure, I needed to increase uh, my skills as a salesman, which like I said, I hated that. I really, it's one thing to create something that's a reflection of yourself. It's another thing entirely to go out, sell it and get denied. And the anxiety of just going door to door and going up to a house and not knowing what people are going to say. And then if you get rejected, you still have another house to go to. It's incredibly difficult, especially for a kid just selling t-shirts. So my most memorable sale was sort of amidst this entire fiasco of what, whatever was going on that I couldn't really comprehend. Um, when I approached the house, I had never really been there before. I didn't really know the family that well. And um, I walked up to the door and the woman's there. And she opens the door and she looks kind of frazzled and is not particularly happy that a kid is at her door with a beach bag full of t-shirts. And she, uh, you know, I start to give my sales pitch. I'm from down the street. I'm selling t-shirts. And she said, no, 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 we're not interested. Thank you. 
But I noticed in the house that there were three boys, you know, just in the living room, seven to 15 years old, maybe. And I stuck my hand on the door right as she was closing. I said, you, you, come here, come here. (laughs) She was like, she almost like hit my arm into that door. It was really awkward. She was a little shocked. The kids were really shocked. They didn't really know what was going on. And I pointed to the the biggest one, the largest one, (laughs) the biggest kid I could see. And I said, you, you, come here, come here. Do you want a t-shirt? So he comes over and he's sort of suspicious. And I'm like, and I give him this t-shirt. He's huge. He's like, he was so much taller than me. So I'd like give up this t-shirt to him. And I'm like, here, here, here. It's free. Now, if you have siblings, you know that when one sibling has something that you don't have, (laughs) you want that something. So the next day I get a phone call from this woman and she's really frazzled on the phone again. And she says, could you come over and could we buy two more t-shirts from you? I was like, sure. So I continued the company for a couple more years. I expanded the product line so we weren't just offering t-shirts, but polo shirts, beach bags, hats, and sweatshirts. Um, And men's and women's sizes, youth, it got really complicated. And um, I expanded, so we weren't just doing it in Seaview anymore, but I was also doing it in, um, I had a general line for my town, which I called Radmad, and then another neighborhood um, nearby. But what ultimately kept me going with this was the responses that I was getting from my customers. It's one, I mean, just seeing them buy it and use it is amazing. It's an amazing thing to see something you've created become you know, part of somebody's life. Um, but it's another thing entirely when it becomes a reflection of their identity. And that's what these became. These really became a symbol of what it meant to be from these different places. And all these different people from all over the world coming together. I mean, I would send this stuff for Christmas in like Japan to people. It was awesome. Um, And so it was really unique to being able to, you know, create something that people so identified with. So this life experience sort of helps set the stage for Bates Art Society, BAS, which is a club I founded uh, last year here at Bates. Um, And originally it was just going to be film. We were just going to be producing and featuring student films on our website. And um, we quickly find out that that was not going to work. Um, For one thing, it's incredibly difficult producing, um, creating films on a regular basis and then putting them on a website and then you have to make sure that people, you know, you need to create new content so that people are coming back constantly. so it was incredibly difficult. That was, that was an, a difficult approach. And we fi- quickly found out that that was not going to work. And um, when we started to talk to students and faculty and see sort of how their take was on this, we realized that there was a larger underlying issue going on. And that was that students and, and faculty didn't feel like there was a form for them to showcase their artwork, a reflection of their identity. People didn't feel like they had the resources outside of the art departments to, you know, venture into creations that they wanted to do because the art departments are, you know, their resources are meant for those taking art. Um, So we realized that there really wasn't a lot of opportunity for art and non-art majors to showcase and create artwork outside of the academics, which is really frustrating and kind of sad. I mean, that's a huge issue. If you can't do something that you really love to do and then show it to people, that's the whole point of how we learn. So we pivoted the club's direction and chose to focus on showcasing student artwork here at Bates, all kinds of arts and cultural events. Now we feature student artwork. We started with our website, which we launched uh, this past January. So we collect all the different artwork and upload it to our website. Um, But we also host a a number of events on campus, festivals, gallery openings. We had the Parents Weekend Festival this past year, or this past um, couple of months. Um, And the whole goal of the organization is to actually fundamentally address the issues, the issues concerning the arts here at Bates, uh, the institutional issues that are preventing people from being able to partake in something that they really love to do. So at first, it was a bit overwhelming starting this organization. I had never really worked with a group of people before. <laughs> yeah. Um, if the chalk town was any indication of that. Um, but I had never gotten the opportunity to really work with a group of people um, and like collaborate on doing something. I didn't, you know, I was learning how to communicate and how to delegate and how to really bring the club about with, you know, delegating all these different roles around. 
Um, and it's, it was sort of difficult seeing, I've learned now more, but it was difficult at first seeing people sort of having an interest in something and letting them go off on tangent and doing it. Not that I had any authority over letting them do it or not, but just like not having to like micromanage everything. It was kind of hard. Um, but it, it's amazing. I love working in a group. I much prefer working in a group now because it's so, it's so much fun to work with people who are so interested and invested in the same idea as you, but have such a different approach about it and have such a different way of like going about it completely. It's a really special experience being able to work with people like that. So we still have some issues within the club itself. A lot of people don't know what Bates Art Society is on campus, artists included, um, and even more so, even worse, they feel excluded from it. So to address this, we're starting a campaign in a couple of weeks called I Am An Artist, where we're sort of getting back to this idea of what the club's really about, which is making it, giving artists the opportunity to showcase their identity to the Bates community and beyond. It's about creating those forms from which people can express themselves. Um, and we're also collaborating, uh, the, the bigger part um, outside of the arts at Bates, which I talked about, is that this collaboration aspect among the arts, among uh, the different departments and the clubs, it's a lot of different, there's a lot of art going on at Bates, but there's not necessarily a lot of communication, a lot of dialogue going on. Um, and even just these past couple of weeks, I, I have personally realized that I didn't really realize before, is that there's a mindset at Bates that, and this is a larger mindset, I believe, too, of you know, art in general, is that public art especially, or art that's put on um, you know, out in the open, is, is to be treated something as vandalism, is something disturbing you know, the, the, the rest of the institutions around it. Um, so we're working with, it, what's happening now, it's really fascinating. Um, we're working with all these different clubs, um, Bollywood, Dance, uh, Ballroom, WRBC, all these different organizations like the Bates Arts Collaborative, um, Dean of Students um, with Josh McIntosh, the President's Office, Chase Hall, all these different entities who realize that there is a problem with the arts at Bates, that there is a problem with this um, ability to create forms from which to express yourself. And uh, we're working together now to really figure out how to address these issues. Um, some, of the, some of the things we're planning, we're creating a space in Chase Hall and Arts Commons where art majors, but mostly art, non-art majors, will have resources there to create artwork, to create work, um, participate in workshops, host workshops for the uh, community, and also display their work there. Um, we're, cre we're working with all these different people, um, these different entities to create forums all across campus to exhibit our work um, that are all going to be student curated. And we're working to also fundamentally address and change the public art policy here at Bates and how that inhibits a lot of the artwork that's put up to create a mindset that it's not, it's, it's okay to put up your work without fear of having it be removed. It's okay to express yourself without fear of having it, you know, destroyed. It's a collaboration on a mass scale, and it's really exciting to see, and it's really exciting to be a part of it. And I, I think it speaks volumes about the Bates community here, the Bates community here, that we are such a proactive campus, we are such a proactive group, we are willing to make changes, and we will work hard to do that. Artists, like entrepreneurs, are creating something to be used, to be, to be critiqued, to be observed. It's what, they cre what they're creating is a reflection of themselves, of their identity, of their beliefs, of their aspirations, of their time. And what we're working on collaborating now with all these different groups is the same thing that I was doing when I was making that chalk town, which is creating something that people can use, but more importantly, makes them happy. It's incredibly, it's amazing to see people in a forum where they have such happiness in being able to share pieces of themselves. It's how we build relationships, friendships, and learn. Artists, humanitarian, business people, people. If you can create a forum through which people can express their identity, it's amazing the stuff you'll see and the things you'll learn. Because when you're looking at these differences and when you're sharing these differences, you find out that really there aren't many differences among us at all. And that's what, mo that's what has motivated me in doing these different ventures. Thank you.